Good morning. My name is Pastor Troy. I'm one of the pastors here at Two Cities. I want to welcome you to Two Cities Church, especially those online. We had a struggle for the past few weeks, but we want to thank you for working with us through this and being patient with us at the same time and sending up prayers to God to allow us to make the necessary changes in order to get back online. And by your prayers and the actions of many people, we're able to get back online. So we thank God for being able to do that, to offer our service to those who are near and far and just can't be here for whatever reason. And if you're new to Two Cities, we want to allow you to keep up with us. You can just text NEW to the number on the screen to help you learn more about who we are and what we're about. I just want to leave, um, read a scripture to you this morning that before I pray, that kind of helps us. I know some of us go through trying weeks and days and we get doubt, we get frustrated, we have anxieties, but I just want to reassure you that we are continue to be covered by the blood of Jesus. And this is found in 1 John 4 and 4, and it reads, you are from God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he who is within you than he who is in the world. So take that verse with you as you go into this coming week to allow you to face the challenges uh, that we all going to face, but we're going to face them with Jesus on our side, trusting and knowing that he's going to cover us. So I'm going to pray, and then I'm going to pass it over to Pete, and he's going to lead us in worship. So, Father, we come before you thanking you for your grace and your mercy of this day that you have blessed us to receive a reasonable portion of health and strength. You clothe us in our right mind. You allow us to be where we are to worship you in spirit and in truth. Now, Lord, as we are here, allow the words to take root in our soul and our bodies, to allow it to take action in our hands and our feet that we will apply your word to our daily activity, that we will seek your face in making decisions that are going to dictate some part of our lives. We ask for strength for those who are dealing with health issues or dealing with life problems, that you will intercede on their behalf. Dispatch angels to each and every person, each and every place under the sound of my voice and those that are watching. Lord, that you would meet their needs where they are to get them to where you would have for them to be. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. I want you to stand up and let us sing some praises to Jesus. When you're, uh, when you're at home, won't you turn the volume up and just um, yeah, let the Holy Spirit just fill us up and, um, as we sing songs to Jesus. Christ is my firm foundation. The rock on which I stand When everything around me is shaking oh, I've never been more glad That I put my faith in Jesus Cause He's never let me down He's faithful through generations So why would He fail now? He won't, no, He won't, I've still got joy in chaos, I got peace that makes no sense, and I won't be going under, I'm not held by my own strength, cause I've built my life on Jesus. And he's never let me down He's faithful in every season So why would he fail now? He won't He won't He won't fail He won't fail Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand when everything around me is shaken. I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus. He's never let me down, He's faithful through generations. So why would he fail now? He won't. No, he won't. He 
won't fail. You won't fail. Rain came, the wind blew, but my house was built on you. I'm safe with you. I'm gonna make it through. Rain came and wind blew, but my house was built on you. And I'm safe with you. I'm gonna make it through. Yeah, I'm gonna make it through. I'm standing strong on you I'm gonna make it through Cause my house is built on you Yeah, I'm gonna make it through I'm standing strong on you I'm gonna make it through Cause my house was built on you Christ is my firm foundation The rock on which I stand When everything around me is shaken I have never been more glad That I put my faith in Jesus Cause He's never let me down He's faithful through generations would he fail now? No, he won't. He won't. He won't fail. He won't fail. No, he won't. He won't fail us. He won't. He won't fail. He won't fail. Before I spoke a word, you were singing over me. You've been so, so good to me Before I took a breath You breathed your life in me You've been so, so kind to me Oh, the overwhelming never love of God oh it chases me down fights till I'm found leaves the 99 and I couldn't earn it I don't deserve it still you give yourself away oh the overwhelming never ending reckless love of God your foe, still your love fought for me. You've been so, so good to me. When I felt no worth, you paid it all for me. You've been so, so kind to me. The overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God Oh, it 
chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99, and I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it, still you give yourself away, oh the overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of God. reading in the Bible this whole week just how Jesus is the true vine and we are the branches and then he gives this example of if the branch is lying over there it cannot bear any fruit such an obvious thing if you are alone it doesn't bear fruit we cannot bear fruit if we are not connected to Jesus this whole week I've been walking around just singing open the eyes of my heart, Lord, that we can see you more, more in our circumstances, in our everyday, Father. Help us be connected to you every day, every day. So open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you, I want to see you, open the eyes of my heart, Lord, open the eyes of my heart. 
Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Let's open the eyes. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. To see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. See you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. So open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. See you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. To see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love. As we sing holy, holy, holy. As we sing holy. As we sing holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. I want to see. Holy, 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 I want to see you. Let's sing worthy. Worthy, worthy, worthy. Worthy, worthy, worthy. Worthy, worthy, worthy. I want to see you. To be able to worship in your presence, Father. So we gather as your church. So we continue to worship. Won't you pray with me this morning? Father, we do thank you for the reality that we can bring each and every little care to you and you will hear us, Father, for you are a personal God. We thank you for this place that we are able to openly worship, to focus entirely upon you. So, Father, we just ask that you open our hearts and minds for the words that Pastor Jeff will bring today and that we would hear and see only you. For it's in your son's most glorious name we pray this morning. And your church said, amen. Grab a seat. We're back in the book of Genesis. We're going to be in Genesis chapter 30 today. But let me tell you about Pam. Pam is a Russian farmer. Pam is a gentleman, lived many years ago. He grew up on his family's land. And his family have been farmers for many, many years. And they didn't have a lot of land, but they were really, really good farmers. So they were able to take a little bit of land and make enough money to be able to raise the children and make a living. 
Pam, just like his father and his grandfather, put his heart and soul into the land. But across the road was a bigger farm. And Pam couldn't help but think about this bigger farm across the road. So one day, he risked it all. He sold the land, he sold the bumper crop, he sold all of his instruments, and he bought this farm across the road, and he started farming wheat. And Pam did really, really well because he was willing to work hard. Pam started bringing in some money, and Pam started to make a little bit of income. And then there was a friend in town who told Pam, do you know that there is a village, it's outside of town, not nowhere close by, but there's a village that has a thousand acres of land for sale. And if you're interested, it's going to cost you everything that you've ever made, your entire life savings. But if you're interested, you have enough that you can probably buy this thousand acre plot of land, which Pam does. And he starts plowing this immense track of land. Pam's family has never had anything like this. And Pam is now becoming wildly successful. And then the same guy says, hey, I just heard of an unprecedented land deal. There's a native tribe in Russia that's trying to become more modern. And they're willing to sell land, listen to this, for a thousand rubles, you can have as much land as you can literally cover in a day. The only deal is you've got to cover it all in, on foot. And, land, and Pam says, there's no way that this could be true. This sounds like way too good of a deal. Do you know how much land that I can cover in circumference in a day? But sure enough, Pam Pam goes to investigate. Sure enough, this thousand rubles will cost him everything that he's ever made, all of his life savings, all that his family has ever invested. But for a thousand rubles, the chief of this native tribe says, he's, he's being honest. We will give you, starting right here at this piece of ground, we will give you as much land as you can humanly cover. Here's the deal. You have to get back to this piece of ground before the sun goes down. Tomorrow morning, when the sun comes up, you meet me here. All of the elders from the tribe will watch you. And as far as your feet can carry you in one cycle of daylight, that's yours for a thousand rubles. This is a short story. I read this story. It's not true. But I read this story and it floored me. It was written by the brilliant Russian author Leo Tolstoy. And Tolstoy's title for this 30, 40 page short story is, How Much Land Does a Man Need? Here's what Tolstoy says happens next. Pam shows up as soon as the sun is getting ready to come over the hills the next morning. He is ready to take off like a bullet. And sure enough, as soon as the village chief says go, Pam takes off and he starts moving. And he moves fast and he moves hard. He doesn't stop to go to the bathroom. He doesn't stop to get a, a drink of water. Halfway through the day, Pam is thinking, I have covered more land than even I believe I can cover. I'm on my way to riches like never seen before. And Pam keeps walking. Pam keeps moving and Pam starts to notice that it's later in the day than he expected. He starts to notice I'm farther away from that starting stake in the ground than I expected. Uh-oh, I'm in trouble. And what Tolstoy describes for the next few pages is Pam's feet are bleeding and Pam is so dehydrated that he's not sure he can make it to the finish line. And finally, as the sun is starting to crest over the hill, as the sun is starting to go uh, down, Pam, with a last gasp of energy, sprints to the end and crosses the stake. And sure enough, he has crossed more land than any human being thought imaginable. And then Leo Toy's story says, right after crossing that stake, Pam falls over dead. And here's the, the moral to the story. And I think Leo Tolstoy nailed it on this one. How much land does a man need? That's the title of the book, the little short story. Six feet of ground is how much that Indian village buries him in. That's Pam's plot of land because he literally killed himself trying to get more and get more and get more until it actually killed him. And today we're going to see an ugly, 
messy tale. I wish this chapter wasn't in the Bible because I hate the fact that we have to look at the way that these people of God are treating one another today. But what we're going to talk about, because you cannot miss it from the Bible today, is about envy. We're going to take a look at rules. If you're like Pam, and it's easy for you to start to look at what everybody else has, start to want what everybody else has, and start to forget what you have, I need to give you a couple of rules that'll come naturally from the scriptures today to help you get over this word on the screen called envy. I hate putting sermon uh, notes up there that give you four rules, three easy steps, five simple solutions, because they sound like self-help. So church, bear with me today. These rules are essential. They're very important. But I am trying to convince you that if you struggle with envy, like I, am, I believe most human beings on the planet do, even I do from time to time, if you struggle with this, you're going to need some supernatural help. And let me show you what it looks like when you finally start to get some victory over the word envy. If you're not exactly sure what this word means, I'm going to show you from the Bible what this means today. But I think the best way to describe the word envy is right here on the screens. Everybody go ahead and say it out loud. Hey, Jeff, you misspelled that second word, right? Not really. Because what the word envy really says is it doesn't matter how good your life is. You look at somebody else's life and you feel miserable about you just because other people are having good stuff in their life. You know that you're struggling with envy if every enjoyment, minus the letter E, because I'm making like an acrostic here, E-N-V-Y, if every enjoyment that somebody else has vexes you, if it makes you miserable to watch other people be happy, you're in a really, really bad place. And this is where two sisters from the scriptures are today. And the Bible just uses this word and throws it right in our face. And I can't help but wonder if it can happen to Rachel and Leah, how often is it happening to God's people today, 2024? So what I want to do is show you how to defeat envy if you have this gene in your DNA, like I have it in my DNA, and like most people on the planet have it. And here's the first step. Just because somebody else is successful, that does not make you a failure. Would you agree with that? How many of you would say, Jeff is a slow runner. If the person next to me in this race on a track, if the person next to me just blows me away, how many of you would say, Jeff, that naturally makes you a slow runner? Would you agree? If the guy next to me was like lost both of his legs in an IED, he's on a walker, the fastest that he can move is, you know, like this, and still he beats me, would you consider me pretty slow? What if I'm running next to Usain Bolt and he blows me away? Does that make me a slow runner? I think some people compare their life to somebody else and they automatically feel bad about their own life because of the life that somebody else has. And in my opinion, that's insane. Just because they're having good stuff doesn't make your life bad. In fact, we can both be fast. I'm just not Usain Bolt fast. Never going to be that fast. But that doesn't make me slow. And just because good things are going on in your life, that doesn't make my life a failure or my life miserable. And somebody needs to tell Rachel this. Because this woman of God should know this, but she doesn't. And we're into the middle of this very ugly, very dysfunctional family relationship between Jacob and his two wives, which I, 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 ideally or uh, ironically before today is going to be over with is now Jacob and four wives, four times the troubles, four times the struggles and the issues. Here's how the story starts. Genesis chapter 30, verse 1. When Rachel, the sister of Leah, when Rachel saw that she was not bearing Jacob any children, she envied her sister. There it is, right in the scriptures. You cannot miss it. And here's her reaction. Give me sons or I will die. Jacob, you better fix this. I need a son and I need him right now. And if I was Jacob, I would answer the way that he did in the scriptures. She said to him, give me sons or I will die. And Jacob became angry with his wife, Rachel, and said, am I in the place of God? 
Basically, this is between you and Jesus. Don't make it between me and you. This is between you and Jesus, not you and Jacob. He has withheld offspring from you. And then she said, here is my maid Bilhah. Go sleep with her and she will bear children for me so that through her I can build a family. So Rachel gave her slave Bilhah to Jacob as a wife, and he slept with her. And sure enough, you already know what's going to happen next, right? Because this has already happened to us in the book of Genesis. Sound familiar to you? Abraham and his wife, Sarah, did the exact same thing. Bilhah conceived and bore a son. And Rachel said, God has vindicated me. Really? Did he really, Rachel? God has vindicated me. Yes, he has heard me and given me a son. So she named him Dan. Rachel's slave Bilhah conceived again and bore Jacob a second son. And Rachel said, and here it is. She's just going to go ahead and be right out there flippant with it. She's just going to own her envy. I have wrestled with God. I have wrestled with my sister and won. And she named this one Naphtali. And I want to ask a couple of questions of the Bible right now. Like, come on, Rachel. Did you not hear the stories of your grandmother, Sarah, who was in the exact same position that you were in? Did you not hear about your mother-in-law, um, Rebecca, who was in the exact same position you're in. They couldn't have children. And Sarah decided, you know what? I know how to fix this problem. We'll go ahead and I'll give my servant to my husband and he can take her as a wife and then I'll have children through her. This is a traditional pagan practice in Old Testament times using a servant as a surrogate. But I want to ask Rachel, what do you think is going to happen when you give your servant, and now Jacob has three wives instead of one wife? How do you think this is going to go for you, Rachel? And I also want to ask her, like, did you not hear the stories about how this went for Sarah and Hagar? Because it didn't go too well for those two after this whole thing went down between Abraham and his wife. And by the way, it went really, really well for the two children, right? For Ishmael and Isaac, it went super good for them, right? wrong. And Rachel, you know better. But Jacob, you definitely got no excuse, bro. You, I know you grew up hearing the stories of Hagar. I know you grew up hearing about Uncle Ishmael or Grand Uncle Ishmael, Uncle, Grand Uncle, whatever, your Uncle Ishmael who had this falling out as a result of what's happening right now. And Jacob goes down the exact same road as Rachel. Or Jacob goes down the exact same road as Abraham, his grandfather. You can hear in the names of the children her envy and her struggles. The name Gad means fortunate. It basically means I, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm glad. I, I'm having, a, a, or the name Dan means vindicated. And it means that God has heard me. God has answered my prayers. And the name Naphtali literally means struggle. And what I find fascinating from the Bible here is Rachel is just saying it out loud. I'm not struggling just with God. I'm struggling with my sister. I don't like what my sister's got. Because every morning when Rachel gets up, she opens her iPhone and starts scrolling through Leah's Instagram feed and notices this mom with all of these children around her. Look at how awesome Leah's life is. And here's what I think is fascinating. Every morning when Leah gets up, she opens her iPhone and starts scrolling through her Instagram feed and says, look at how awesome Rachel's life is. She's so beautiful. Her husband loves her so much, but he doesn't treat me that way. And both of these two are struggling with each other. Both of these two are wrestling with each other. Have you ever seen the documentary, The Social Dilemma? This documentary basically says, be on guard Although it's not inherently evil, there's nothing evil built into the system. Social media can tap into something very ugly inside the human heart. In fact, one of the scientists in The Social Dilemma made this statement. We are training and conditioning a whole new generation of people that when they're uncomfortable... When they're lonely, when they're uncertain, when life doesn't go the way that they want it to go, they have a digital pacifier. That's their words, not mine. A digital pacifier 
that we can use to try to anesthetize or try to stick in our mouth and suck on it to make us better able to deal with how life isn't going the way we want it to go. And what Rachel is doing is she's looking at everything Leah has instead of noticing the one thing that she does have. Her husband loves her dearly. What Leah is doing is looking at everything that Rachel has instead of the thing that she has. She, God has given her children and an abundant family, and they can't even see the good stuff in their own life because they're so preoccupied. They envy so much what's happening in their sister's life, and you cannot defeat envy until someone else's success doesn't make you feel like a failure. Just because things are going well in somebody else's life doesn't mean that it's naturally, that your life is naturally a failure. But can I remind you of something? Nothing, and I mean absolutely nothing, can satisfy your soul but Jesus. Do you believe that? If you believe that, then I want to hear you say this out loud. Substitute the word your for the word my. Say it out loud. Nothing can satisfy my soul but Jesus. And the problem with envy is we are taking our attention off of Jesus and looking at something else and hoping that that thing will satisfy my soul. But you weren't created to be satisfied by anything other than Jesus. I wish Rachel heard this. I wish Leah believed this because if she believed it, then she probably wouldn't respond the way that she does next. Leah can't possibly let Rachel catch up. I've already got four sons. I'm not about to let my sister catch up. So here's what I'm going to do. Leah saw that she had stopped having children and she took her slave, Zilpah, and gave her to Jacob as a wife. How many wives does Jacob have now? Four. Jacob, are you insane? Leah's slave Zilpah bore a son to Jacob. And Leah said, what good fortune. And she named him Gad. Can I tell you something about the name Gad on the screen? There is absolutely no reference to God whatsoever. Like, I just won the lottery. I'm super lucky. Things are going great for me. And she forgot about God all along in this equation. And when Leah's slave Zilpah bore Jacob a second son, maybe God convicted her a little bit because she said, I am happy. Women will call me happy. And she named him Asher. Did you notice that Leah's no longer concerned about how her husband feels about her? She's no longer concerned about her relationship with God. In fact, if you look at her words on the screen, what's most important in Leah's mind right now? How do other people think about me? What do other people say about me? That's how twisted Leah's heart has become because she's in this competition, this struggle with her sister, Rachel. And both of their answers are to make life better for me since I have to wrestle with my my sister for my husband's attention. I know what I'll do. I'll add two more wives to the equation. That ought to make my life super good. That ought to make it really easy for my husband or really easy for my family. And neither one of them are willing to stop at this point and ask the question, how can my life possibly get better by adding more children and more women, more wives to the equation? In fact, if either one of them were willing to think about it, they would see how insane envy is. But they can't. All they can see is what Rachel has that I don't have. And I want what Rachel has or what Leah has, but I don't have. And I want what Leah has. And so they forget about everything that they have and they only think about what somebody else has. And what they're wanting is another child to satisfy my whole, my soul. Or maybe with the praise of other people in town, maybe it will make me feel good about myself. When in reality, the thing that really does satisfy your soul deep on the inside is only going to come from a relationship with Jesus. I wish Leah, I wish Rachel recognized that. 
The great church father, St. Augustine, made it this, uh, put it very plainly this way. Our souls are restless until they rest in Jesus. What he was saying is God has created us with this Jesus-shaped hole in our soul. You can try everything in the world that somebody else has, and it's not going to fill that Jesus-shaped hole in your soul. Only Jesus can do that. And apparently... This isn't just a problem in Old Testament times halfway around the world. Apparently, this is a problem in the United States, and it is becoming a, uh, a, a trend in the United States. We are heading in a really bad direction. Did you know that about a week ago, the United Nations released its World Happiness Report? Has anybody ever heard about this? They rank all of the countries in the world, and they rank them all based on three things. They rank them all based on how satisfied is your life, how positive are your emotions, how negative are your emotions. Do you know the richest, the most um, affluent society in the world by a landslide? Like never in the history of the world have you seen this much riches, this much opportunity, this much um, affluence in the world. Does anybody have any idea what that country is? It's ours, the United States. Do you know where we list on the world's most satisfied countries? We list number 23 on that list. Listen, y'all, we're behind Slovenia. We don't even rank as high as Chechnya. The people in Iceland are far happier than people that live in the United States. I guess that's just because if you're in Iceland and you got sun over your head during the middle of the summertime, you're, you're, in, a, uh, you're uh, in a good place. But we rank just above Mexico and just barely above Saudi Arabia on this list. The last time this was done four years ago, we were number 15 on the list. Today, the United States is number 23 on the list. And someone, a very brilliant mind, has once said, in a society that's saturated with all kinds of pleasures and all kinds of choices, you have two kinds of slaves in that type of society. You have the person that's addicted, and then you have the person that envies. And the person that's addicted is always better off than the person that envies somebody else. Because there's treatment programs that we can give you to help your addiction. But if you envy somebody else because of what they got, and it causes you to forget about what you have, there's not a lot of help out there. There's really no physical, emotional help that we can give you. This one is going to require supernatural help. This one is going to remind you that only Jesus can satisfy your soul. But there will be some times that you're going to look around and the person that won first place trophy, you're going to say, I gave it my all. I worked as hard as I can. I really, really wanted that first place trophy. The person that has that lifestyle that you've been working yourself like a dog for, and that things are going well for them, but they're not going well for you. You're just going to naturally wish that you had that lifestyle. And when those moments come, I'm going to tell you, it's okay to take them to Jesus. It's okay to vent to the Holy Spirit and just to share openly and be very raw with God about what you feel like because sometimes you are going to notice the good stuff that's happening in somebody else's life and it's not happening for your life. And I want to remind you, if God in heaven loves you, if he is sovereign and he controls all the circumstances of life, he knows what you're going through. So it's okay to go ahead and vent to him. And let him know, I'm not really happy about the fact that my sister can squeeze out children like crazy and I can't have any. So, Genesis chapter 30. Listen to what kind of a mess this family becomes. I don't even know what to do with this language, to be honest with you. Reuben, one of the children of Leah, goes out into the wheat har out into the field during the wheat harvest and he found some mandrakes in the field. Now I should tell you that mandrakes have a bad rap in Old Testament times. The Arabians referred to mandrakes as the devil's apple. 
And what the Greeks used to call mandrakes is this passion fruit, or the Greeks would refer to mandrakes as love apples. And most societies viewed mandrakes as like an aphrodisiac. The smell of them alone could put you in the mood. And if you ate the mandrakes, that would make you fertile. And I can't help but believe that that's what Rachel thinks is going to happen to her. So Reuben goes out. He's in the field. He finds some mandrakes. And of course, he comes back to mama with him. And he brought them to his mother, Leah. Rachel asked, please give me some of your son's mandrakes because I really, really want to get pregnant. I'm going to add that in there. But Leah replied to her, isn't it enough that you have already taken my husband? Now pause for just a second. Rachel didn't really do this. Leah didn't really do this. It's actually their father, Laban's fault, that he pulled the switcheroo on Jacob on the wedding night, and Jacob ended up going to bed with Leah when he thought he was marrying Rachel, and then just a couple of days later, marries uh, Rachel as well. But I got to wonder, Rachel, Leah, you had to know what was happening on the night of the wedding, on the wedding night, right? Like it wasn't, uh, you had to have some involvement in this whole switcheroo. And now we've got a big mess in the family. And so she says, isn't it enough that you've taken my husband? You also want to take my son's mandrakes? Well, then Rachel said, he can sleep with you tonight in exchange for your son's mandrakes. And when Jacob came in from the field that evening, Leah went out to meet him and said, you must come with me for I have hired you with my son's mandrakes. I don't even know what to say about the language when a wife says to her husband, I have hired you. Do you know what that sounds like to me? So Jacob slept with her that night and God listened to Leah and she conceived and bore a fifth son. And she said, God has rewarded me for giving my slave to my husband. Now, this name is a deliberate play on words. It's a pun. And she named him Issachar. And then Leah conceived again and bore a sixth son. And God has given me a good gift, Leah said. This time, my husband will honor me. Because I have bore him six sons. The first five didn't work, but it's definitely going to work on number six. And she named him Zebulun. And later, Leah bore a daughter and named her Dinah. And I'll go into the names of Zebulun in just a second. Um, but I just want to say, I think the name Dinah means only girl among 12 brothers. You're never going to get seconds at the dinner table. Just forget about it. Zebulun is a pun, and it basically says the name means honor me, but it means reward me for my hard work. The reason why it's a pun, it's a play on words, is if you're working hard, it's not a reward, it's payment. And if it's a reward, you don't have to work hard. And she's making a play on words with her son's name. The second son, or the last son that she bore to him, the name of the second son, Zebulun, is the name of, well, actually, I got this wrong. So the name Issachar means a reward for my wages. The name Zebulun means honor me. My husband didn't love me, didn't treat me right with the first five sons. But now with number six, certainly he's got to treat me right now, right? Because with the first five, it didn't get his attention. Now maybe with son number six, he's going to love me. He's going to treat me right. He's going to honor me. And you can see all she's trying to do is compete with her sister and make sure that she stays one child ahead of her sister. This dysfunction between Rachel and Leah is 100% because of envy. The brilliant German scientist, statesman, poet, Goethe, made this statement. He said, hatred is active, envy is passive, but both of them are the same thing. And then he made this statement, hatred is only one step farther than envy. You start out envying somebody and you don't like them for what they have. And more importantly, you start to forget what you do have because all you can see is what they, what you don't have. 
and it starts to cloud your mind. And hatred will always impact your relationship with another human being. Look up here, church. Envy, 100% of the time, will always impact your relationship with God. And more importantly, it's going to impact your relationship with yourself. Did you ever wonder why God conclu- or adds this one to his top 10 list? You know, number 10 in the Ten Commandments, you shall not cover your neighbor's house or your neighbor's wife or your neighbor's animals or your neighbor's field or your neighbor's Harley Davidson motorcycle or your neighbor's beach body or your neighbor's brilliant vacation. You shouldn't want all of those things. You shouldn't covet all of those things. And because it's in the top 10, this is just as dangerous for you as murder or adultery or idolatry will be. That's how dangerous this is to your soul. Why? Because wanting those things, envying those things, desiring those things has to take your attention off of God. And if it takes your attention off of God, you are making your own life miserable by watching somebody else and wanting what somebody else has. Instead of just enjoying what God has given you and what he has in store for you in the future. You haven't really beat envy until you can get to this step. Until you can genuinely rejoice when somebody else is successful and you're not. Until you can genuinely say, I'm happy things went well for them, even though they didn't go the way I wanted them to go. I'm genuinely happy for them, and I don't have any, you know, ulterior motives. And unfortunately, Rachel and Leah... Never get there today. Here's how the passage we're going to look at ends today. Then God remembered Rachel. We don't know how long this took. Let's assume that this is at least 10 or 12 years because at this point, her sister has already had seven children, six boys and a girl, before Rachel has conceived. So I'm assuming we're talking 10, 12, 14 years at a minimum of crying out to God, I want a baby, I'm desperate for a child. And finally, God hears those prayers. And he listened to her, and he opened Rachel's womb. And she conceived and bore a son. And she said, God has taken away my disgrace. So she named him Joseph and said, may the Lord add another son to me. The name Joseph It's actually two words, Jah or Yahweh, the first half of the word, and the second half of the word means that he um, has removed or he has taken it away. But the name Joseph, and by the way, he doesn't like to be called Joe, is very, very close to what it sounds like to say, Yahweh will add another one. Like, he's taken away my disgrace, but I know he's going to add more to my family in the future. And even still, Rachel, after she gets the one thing that she's been waiting for, is still desperate for more. She can't even enjoy her first son because she wants to catch up with Leah. And she wants a second son. How many of you out there have memorized that Bible verse? From Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. I can do all things, say the rest, through Christ who gives me strength. I love verses 12 and 13. See what the great apostle Paul, the guy who's writing this famous verse that people tattoo and they write it down and they recite to themselves when stuff is going hard. What the famous apostle Paul said is, I have been miserable at times in my life. I've had times in my life where everything is going right and everything is going good. I've had times in my life where I'm literally at death's door and starving to death. And in each of those circumstances, God has showed me the secret of contentment. He literally says, I have learned to be content. Because the sin nature, when it gets inside of you, 
is going to try to steal that contentment, that inner peace, even though stuff is going crazy on the outside around you. The sin nature is going to steal that away from you, and it's going to try to take your attention off of Jesus and put it over here on the beach vacation that this lady is taking on Instagram, on the way that this guy's career is taken off like a rocket ship and yours looks like it's going nowhere. And when you do that, it is inevitably taking your attention away from Jesus. So church, I've been praying for you. I've been praying for me all week long that God would teach us contentment and we would be able to be at peace with who we are and with what's going on around us because we know that our God is sovereign, that he controls the universe. And if you really want to beat envy, here's those steps all over again. You have to get to the point that somebody else's success doesn't make you a failure. You have to get to the point that you realize nothing that I earn, nothing that I buy, nothing that I receive here on planet earth can satisfy my soul. Only Jesus can do that. You have to get to the point that when you're frustrated and when things aren't going the way that you want them to, because all of us are going to have those moments, you can vent to the Holy Spirit. And then finally, you can get to the point when stuff goes well and somebody else succeeds you don't feel miserable about it. You can be genuinely happy for them because you know the God of the universe loves you. He hasn't forgot about you and he's gonna take care of you. So let's just put what we're reading from the Bible today into practice. Just don't let it go in one ear and out the other and you just go back to living your life the same way this week. Maybe somebody in this room, you really need to have your heart changed for the first time. If that's you, I'm going to pray for you in just a moment. For a lot of us in this room, and this is me from time to time, you need to be more content with who you are and whose you are tomorrow than you were today. And for others of you in this room, chances are you know somebody who is under the bondage of envy. They are a slave to what everybody else has and what they don't have and they need somebody to help them figure out how to be free from that. So maybe God is sending you and putting you in their life so that you can help them understand that. Would you bow your heads? Would you let me pray for you right now? Father, this passage that we're looking at today from the Bible, it's just a mess. These two sisters, Rachel and Leah, they should be loving. They should be serving one another. They should be lifting each other up. And instead of doing that, they're struggling with each other. And God, if I'm honest, this is me from time to time. And my guess is this is everybody who's listening to my voice. It happens to them too. So in those moments, God, where we are taking our attention off of you and putting it on what somebody else has, would you forgive us? Would you pull the attention back to you where it belongs? And would you give us the ability to say, in good times and bad times, I've learned to be content because the God of the universe loves me. He loves me so much that he was willing to give his son up for me. And I am going to rest in the love of my father in heaven. For somebody in this room, maybe somebody who's listening online, who has never stepped across the line of faith, never really became your son or daughter, maybe this is the moment that you're tapping on their soul and saying you're trying to fill your life up with everything else and it's not working because it's me and only me that can fill you up. And maybe right where they're sitting, in a hotel room or in this room, they just need to surrender a prayer, uh, pray a prayer of surrender to you that they would say, God, forgive me. God, I surrender to you, and I am turning my soul over to you. I'm asking, would you change me? Would you make me into a new person? Would you adopt me into your family, and would you satisfy the deepest recesses of my soul? God, would you do that miracle of new birth right now? And would you honor that prayer if it's coming from a sincere heart? But God, would you also give us the privilege of learning about this commitment that they're making? And then helping them to figure out what the basics of following Jesus looks like. God, send us out to push back darkness and make a big impact in this community, in our country, and around the world. I pray this in the matchless name of Jesus. Will the church say amen?
Hey, guys, I'm going to show you a video of some of the stuff that's going on in our church. And then after that, we're going to ask you to stick around for a few minutes. But check this video out, will you? Hi, I'm Siobhan. And I'm Troy. And here's what you need to know before you go. At Two Cities, we want you to find your spot. This is week two of our discipleship program that you can either look at, you can either watch online or you can...